non-planar wings. They are a little known secret among aerodynamicists. We are all very used to planar wings. Planar wings are just a standard flat wing that has some type of airfoil profile, whether that's like a NACA 0012 or NACA 0006 or whatever. And planar wings are very good in that they are very simple. But non-planar wings are even better because non-planar wings are when the wing is curved to some extent, whether that is the wingtip is bent up or the entire wing is rounded and forms a ring or even a box. In the last two examples, we see the extreme cases of a non-planar wing, but even a wing with a winglet, that thing that goes vertically up at the end, is a non-planar wing because it's not in one like uh, axis. Now, why are they important? What makes these non-planar wings special? Well, to some extent, non-planar wings are special because we can consider the Oswald efficiency factor. So the Oswald efficiency factor is this number that tells us how much or little induced drag a wing will produce. For those who don't know, the induced drag is a component of drag, predominantly of objects that produce lift, because the full name of this term is actually lift-induced drag. The Oswald efficiency factor is a number that relates to this quantity. So traditionally, it ranges between zero and one, with one being perfect. In fact, for a very long time, aeronautical engineers uh, put in so much effort and resources to make a wing that was one in terms of Oswald Fisher's factor. In fact, the Supermarine Spitfire, which is arguably the most iconic fighter jet of World War II, was made with an elliptical wing in an effort to achieve this Oswald Fisher's factor of one. The elliptical plan form is so much harder to make than a straight one, like what the P-51 Mustang had, for example, which is another iconic fighter jet of World War II. But the makers deemed it so worthwhile because the gain in efficiency which is due to a lower induced drag, was worth the time, effort, and resources put in to get an elliptical plan form, or more accurately, an elliptical lift distribution. Like, I cannot express to you just how much time, effort, and resources were put into over the years to get an Oswald Fisher factor of 1, despite just how much harder it is to do. And going through my tertiary education, we learned all about this. In fact, in our aeronautical classes, this was a major feature. And then I started my PhD, and my PhD was actually largely to do with induced drag. And when I started, I looked at wings through the lens of an Oswald efficiency factor, because that's what I knew. So where the elliptical wing, or more accurately, a wing with elliptical di lift distribution, um, which means that when you go near the uh, root, there is much more lift than near the wingtip, which is where the lift drops off to zero. But one day in the summer of my first summer of my PhD, when the entire building was a ghost town, I read this paper by a guy called Ilan Crew. And in this paper, he and his co-author covered the efficiency of wings where the tips were rounded up and even to the point where it formed a box. And in this paper, they gave the Oswald efficiency factors of these designs. And much to my surprise, these wings had Oswald efficiency factors greater than one, the maximum value I thought was possible and the maximum value that is commonly taught. And what I didn't know at the time was that this value of one was the maximum theoretical value possible but for planar wings, not for non-planar wings. So all this effort that went into making planar wings to be as efficient as possible could easily be achieved with a non-planar wing. And that is what we're looking at today. We're looking at two different types of non-planar wings and compare, comparing them to their planar counterpart. So to do so, we're looking at a paper called Aerodynamic, Characteristic, Aerodynamic Characteristics Comparison Between Spiroid and Blended Winglets. And this bad boy is open access, so you can find it in the link in the description. So in figure one, we see the two different non-planar wings we'll be looking at today. So let's scroll down to those, just here. And the first one is called a spiroid, and this is where you have a loop at the wing tip. The second one is called a blended wing, and which is literally just the winglet that we have all come to know and love on most Boeing airliners. That's at the end, you just see that like little fin popping up. Now, the thing about the naming convention of different wingtips is that there are so many different types. And quite frankly, it seems that every Tom, Dick and Harry has a different naming convention. Now, my name is not Tom, Dick or Harry. My name is Mike, so I don't know where that leaves me. But I guess I'll just pick the naming convention that seems most logical. So, for example, the spiraled wingtip is a little cryptic. In my opinion, a loop wingtip is a much more descriptive name. But nonetheless, let's proceed with the spiraled wingtip because that's what these authors use. Now, to investigate these non-planar wings, these authors did CFD and experiments, which I really like when there is this combination of the two, because done well, these two approaches complement each other. So for the CFD, these geezers used the Fluent package from ANSYS, which is uh, actually one of the most common packages, I think probably the most common package. And in figure three, we see the domain these wings were put in, which is the good old C-shape inlet. Now, I've gone through why this 
shape is good for CFDing a wing in the past. But just briefly, it allows you to change the angle of attack of the wing without having to remesh it, which saves a lot of time and a lot of resources. So that's very smart to do here. And these guys also did a grid independence test, which is nice to see because it seems like forever on this podcast as we've seen a good one. So let's see if this is a good one. So let me zoom in a bit here. We have on the uh, y-axis, the lift coefficient, and on the x-axis, the number of, co- of number of elements, the number of cells. So obviously here, the lift coefficient was the thing that they were most interested in, which is why they plotted it here. Now for a grid independent study, typically you will look at the parameters that you're interested in. So if you're interested in the drag coefficient as well, you should do one for the drag coefficient as well to make sure that it's being stable across the cells that you are testing across. And that is, I guess, where we come to the first uh, little hiccup of this CFD um, independent study. These researchers also looked at the drag coefficient and they should have really um, looked at the drag coefficient in this grid independent study as well to make sure that their results were accurate. They only did the lift coefficient. But anyway, let's look at this grid independent study in figure four. So they are quite short on their description of the grid independence test. They don't tell us what angle attack the wing was at, or even the velocity, or actually even the wing type, whether it was the flat wing, the spiraled wing, or the wing, winglet wing. Anyway, looking at the converged value for the lift coefficient, which is about 0.11, if we were to, if we trace that onto the lift coefficient graph in figure 11, so let's go to figure 11 and trace where that is, a lift coefficient of 0.11 here, um, here we go. So we see if we trace this down, it seems like it would give us a angle attack of maybe minus one degree. So um, I'm not sure if that's accurate or not, but from this graph, that's what I am concluding here, I guess. There's no other real way of figuring out what the angle attack is. So let's say the angle attack was minus one degree for this uh, grid independent study. So the good news is that for this study, the lift coefficient did uh, converge as the grid got finer. The bad news is that they didn't really see this convergence un- occur when they increased the cell number a lot. So what I mean is um, that if you had a mesh of 1 million cells and then you increased it to 1 million and one cell and you got the same lift question, would you say that the grid has converged? No, of course you wouldn't because you only increased the number of cells by one. So there are metrics you can use to determine if you've increased the number of cells enough to ensure the grid has converged. Actually, a guy named Lars Davidson did some really good work on this. Um, and we have actually covered this in detail in our CFD intermediate course. But in a nutshell, these researchers only saw the lift, same lift question Um, value going from 5.2 million-ish cells to about 6.5 million-ish cells. And that increase is not enough to conclude that the grid has converged, actually. So don't get me wrong, it's a good attempt, but not entirely accurate. Um, So from this grid independent study, we can't conclude that the grid has converged because that increase in cells is only like 25%, which is not a lot. One interesting thing they say is that they used unstructured tetrahedral mesh for their, their meshing. So this is good and bad. The reason why it is good is because unstructured meshes are very good at resolving curves. And here they do have some wing features that are quite curvy. And they are much better at doing this than structured meshes. So to resolve a curve with a structured mesh, you need to make all of the cells much finer. But with an unstructured mesh, you can use far fewer cells and only refine the regions where the curvature is high. The bad thing about unstructured meshes is that they can result in more cells than the structured mesh if much of the geometry doesn't need a stru- unstructured mesh. So if you have only a little bit of the mesh of the geometry that needs um, refinement and then you use unstructured everywhere, well, then you're increasing the cell number a lot. So it takes some thinking to determine whether it's better to go for the unstructured mesh to compare compared to the structured mesh. And I mean, you might just say that you can just run both meshes and see once you've got it done and what level of refinement you need. But that alone is very time consuming because you also have to do a good independent study for each one to make sure that you've reached the point where you have enough cells. So you're often left to make this decision based on an educated guess as to whether you to use unstructured or structured cells. In the case of airfoils and wings, a structured mesh is like the overwhelming favorite but this is for a simple wing, for a planar wing. What we have here is not really a simple wing, it is a non-planar wing. We have spiraled winglets as well as um, the blended winglets, which have some quite tight turns. So I think that these researchers made the right choice here when they used the unstructured mesh. 
because if they used um, the structure mesh to resolve these features, they would probably end up with either a really bad mesh around the turns or a mesh with a really high cell count. So I think that the unstructured mesh was the way to go here. So let's move on to the conditions of the CFD simulations. So they say that they used the K-Amiga turbulence model, which I personally would not have gone with at this Reynolds number. So the Reynolds number that they tested this at was 372,000. And while they don't say what the turbulence intensity level was in the wind tunnel, um, at least what I can see here, at this Reynolds number, they are likely going to be, there's likely going to be a lamp separation bubble on the suction surface of the wing. And if you don't know what a laminar separation bubble is, or also known as an LSB, we have done a few podcasts on them. And if you want to learn a lot about them, check those out. But in a nutshell, I'll just say that an LSB is where you have the flow going over a surface and it is still laminar to begin with. Then strangely, it lifts off the surface. And while it is off the surface, it transitions to turbulence and then reattaches soon afterwards. So the region where the flow has separated, there is this additional flow that is just recirculating around in this pocket underneath this separated region. And this is called the lamp separation bubble. And that's because it is a bubble. <laughs> so this LSB is a way for the boundary layer to transition to turbulence. And it is a gentle way of doing so, which occurs at low turbulence density levels. The surface also has to be quite smooth and there aren't too many flow features that sh is st are stirring up the rest of the flow. So it's a fairly gentle way of transitioning from laminar to turbulent. So in this simulation, we have these conditions, which is why it is a prime candidate for an LSB to form. As such, the, LS the K-Mega Terminus model isn't a great predictor for the LSB. In fact, no Terminus model is fantastic at doing so um, because the LSB is very much a boundary layer phenomenon and all RAS Terminus models are pretty much a prediction and not actually resolving what is going on in the boundary layer. So as such, a more sophisticated approach like LES is always better, but obviously because of our limited resources, it isn't really an option for such a large wing right now. This wing was like, um, I think a couple meters or so. Or even, even like half a meter wing is still uh, quite difficult to do an LS. Uh, earlier simulation on. So as such, the best approach that I have found to predict an LSB is to use the K-Amiga SST turbulence model for your RANS portion of the CFD. I found that to give much better results um, with this uh, thermos model than an LSB thermos model. Um, so I think that using the K-Amiga without the SST portion is not going to be as good for the results here, but we'll get into that later on. So. For the other simulation settings, they tested this wing at a bunch of angles of attack ranging from zero degrees to 90 degrees, which is well within the um, stall regime of the wings. Now they do so they do show how similar their results are to validation data, but they don't do it just yet. They um, actually go into it in the results section. And let me tell you, the results are very interesting. So there is going to be a lot going on there, which we'll cover once we've gone through the rest of this experimental setup and safety setup. So having said that, let's go to the experimental work. So they say that their wings were 3D printed, which is really cool. And this might actually help them suppress the LSB on the wing because 3D printing is typically quite rough, like the surface is left quite rough. And while I can't tell from these pictures, I think I can see the layers of the print, which means that the surfaces are quite rough. Like here, maybe there's definitely some roughness there. So whether that will get rid of the LSB or not, I don't know, but it will definitely affect how large it is. So as I mentioned earlier, they don't give the exact turbulence intensity of the experiments, but they do give the contraction ratio of the wind tunnel. And they say it's nine to one, which is quite high actually. Um, the higher the contraction ratio is, the lower the turbulence intensity usually is. And while I don't know much about their mesh screens or honeycomb, from the contraction ratio like this, um, we could probably say we're looking at a turbulence intensity of around 0.7% perhaps. Um, that is quite a good turbulence intensity to get LSBs forming. And even if it was 1%, we would still probably expect them. So I think we're in the prime territory to get LSBs on this wing. So let's move on to figure eight, figures eight, nine, and 10, which show the three different wings installed. So we have the planar wing, the spiraled wing, and the um, wing with the winglet. The spiraled wing looks pretty cool. <laughs> so one thing they say is that the density of air that they used to non-dimensionalize their drag and lift forces to get the coefficients was 1.225 kilograms per meter cubed. Now, if you have listened to our podcast for a while, you will know that assuming that the density of air is anything is a bad idea. 
So they say here it's 1.225 kilograms per meter cubed. And in fact, the density of air changes every day and throughout the day. Fluctuations of 2% are very normal throughout the day, and even 4% occurs quite frequently. So in fact, just to show you how the density of air changes and is almost never 1.225 kilograms per meter cubed, or even 1.2 kilograms per meter cubed, right now, while I'm sitting here doing this podcast, the density of air is 1.187 kilograms per meter cubed. So you definitely want to take that density of air into account when you are doing your experiments because that changes the validation data, the Reynolds number, and even the wind tunnel of the speed of the wind tunnel. And I know that density of air in my office here in this room that I'm doing my podcast in is 1.187 kilograms per meter cubed because I'm using an instrument that we make actually, it's called the Amateur Hawk, which measures it for us. So in fact, these researchers actually gave us the temperature and barometric pressure, but not the humidity of their air. And so let's assume that the humidity was 0%. And with the temperature that they give of 288 Kelvin and a pressure of one bar, which I don't think is one bar because it's rarely one bar. Like it, that changes as well throughout the day and from day to day. But let's assume it is as they're saying here. So with these temperatures and pressures um, and a de- humidity of 0%, the density would have been uh, 1.209 kilograms per meter cubed, not 1.225. And on the other hand, if the humidity was 100%, then the density of air was 1.201 kilograms per meter cubed, again, not 1.225. So we can conclude that the density of air in their experiments was not 1.225 kilograms per meter cubed, as they stated. But let's move on. Let's look at the results. So in figure 11, we see the lift coefficient plots for the three configurations for their experiments and CFD. So let's scroll down to this figure here and zoom in perhaps a little bit more. Here we go. This is good. So the results are very strange. So first of all, the dashed lines are for the experiments and the solid lines are for the CFD. Let's address the elephant in the room and here and say that the CFD didn't really match the experiments very well. The general trend is there. The stall angle is pretty good. The CFD, however, shows that for much of the slope of the lift coefficient, the wing, the um, all three wings are fairly different to the experiments. Like they're good. 10, 20% off the results. So, but one thing that they do show with the trends is that the wing with the conventional blended winglet, which is the red line here, produces much more lift than the other two wings. And the spiraled one is even more than um, the uh, planar wing as well. So the spiraled winglet is better than the regular wing and the blended winglet is even better than the spiraled wing. But the values that they found here are way off. So for example, at an angle attack of seven degrees, which is this one here, uh, the blended wing in the experiments produces a lift coefficient of about 0.6, while the CFD gives about 0.65, so, and maybe a little bit more. So that's about a 10% difference. And it is quite clear that the CFD overpredicts how much more lift the blended and spiraled wings are producing compared to the experiments. Now, I don't know what the uncertainty bars are for the experimental data. So while this CFD might not seem very good, maybe a 5 or 6 out of 10, given the limitations, it might actually be better than that. And the reason why is because while we always assume that the CF, the experiments are always a gold standard and the CFD doesn't agree with them, in reality, um, it may actually be that the experiments un- and CFD are also both wrong, or there might be a mismatch between the um, settings that we choose or the, the um, conditions. So with this particular case, there are um, there are maybe three potential reasons why the experiments don't match the CFD or vice versa. The first one that we already pointed out is that the air density was different to what was stated. So they stated it's 1.225 kilograms per meter cubed. They probably used that in their CFD, but the experiments are definitely not that. So it's going to give maybe a 1-2% error at least as the, compared to what they reported. But... Another potential error might be um, seen around the 7 to 10 degree mark here. So this region here. So if you look at the experimental data, the dashed lines, we see that they wiggle around quite a lot at these angles of attack. Now the lines are definitely not straight as you would expect. Typically the um, line of the, the, the slope of the lift coefficient at preschool angles of attack is constant. So it's like usually two pi or so, but it, I won't get into that here, but it's usually constant. So here it's not. And the, 
That is because potentially um, a lamp suppression bubble forms over the wings in experiments, and that definitely would affect the lift curve slope. Typically, we will see an increase in the slope when they are present, when the LSB is present, and then when they pop, the slope drops back down. It is possible here that the LSBs are forming over the wings at different angles of attack and popping at different angles of attack to compare to create these wobbles in the slope. Um, if that is the case, then this is not so much an error in the experiments, but simply the inability of the CFD to predict the LSBs, which comes about because they use the Kamiga Thomas model and not the Kamiga SST Thomas model. However, there are two other potential reasons why we see these wobbles here in these slopes. The next reason is that maybe the wind speed of the wind tunnels, or the wind tunnel was calibrated incorrectly. I say that because if we look at 10 degrees for all three experimental lines, um, they drop. And this indicates repeatability to this potential error. It's either error, a systematic error, or um, an actual feature in the flow. If it is an actual feature in the flow, it's probably the LSB. If it's a systematic error, then there are a couple of reasons. One is that um, now potentially the Wind, wind tunnel speed was wrong, the calibration curve. So when you set it to a certain speed and then you run your experiments, maybe that comes out um, like continually systematically wrong. I don't know, um, but I'm guessing it's probably not the case here, but it, it might be. Um, anyway, the third possibility is perhaps there is some error in the mechanism the researchers use to install the wings. So perhaps some error in the angle um, in, in this device, the rotary device. Now to me, uh, this seems unlikely because from what I can see from figure seven, uh, if I scroll up here, we see how the wings were installed. So if I zoom in, we can see this little device here and you can't really see too clearly, but around the edges, you see some hat hashing. This is usually the angle kind of thing. And this means that this is probably a rotary device that they use to turn the, the uh, wings and then they load cell on top of that. So if you are using a rotary device, it is quite uncommon for there to be a big error in this. I mean, these rotary devices are usually very accurate, like to within 0 0.01 degrees. So for there to be an error in the angle that is set here, it could be the case, but I don't think it probably would be from this rotary device. I mean, the... Um, Results indicate that they might be, but I think in practice it's probably not. And I don't think it's probably the um, wind tunnel speed either. I think it's probably to do with the LSB formation. I think that maybe the CFD is just picking it up very well. Now, as for the significant overprediction in the stall regime, this could simply be because, be because of error in the CFD. As I mentioned, there is about a 1% or 2% error in the density of air, which is carried through to the CFD validation process. But the error seen here is much more than a couple percent, it's more like 20%. So it is very common for CFD to break down in the stall regime and not really mimic the experimental results at all. So I think this is far more likely the case, um, but it doesn't mean that this research is an entire loss. The experiments I think are still pretty good and the CFD in some parts is also good. Um, it doesn't give this pre -stool, sorry, it gives the pre stall trends um, quite well and arguably gives some general insight into the performance of these wing tip devices when there is no LSB present. So we can conclude that the regular flat planar wing produces at least uh, lifts across the entire angle attack range um, tested. Like we can see for the experiments in this blue like asterisk, the lift coefficient is always lower than the other two lines. So it's always producing far less lift. Um, and both wing designs are much better, yielding about a 5 to 10% increase across the board. And perhaps a little more in the store regime, maybe about 20% here. And we can also conclude that the blended wing, uh, the conventional winglet, uh, produces the most uh, lift across this range. And then at some points in, in the store regime, okay, the spiraled wing sort of takes a bit of a uh, front seat, but then goes back uh, after that. So with the lift here, we can see that the both wingtips are very beneficial for it. Uh, but let's move on to the drag now, because there is more to a wing's performance than just the lift. So in figure 12, we see the drag coefficient. And the drag coefficient lines for the experiments are even more wiggly here than the lift coefficient. So we can see how much they wiggle around here compared to this plot here. And for the pre regime, both non-planar designs reduce the drag coefficient between about 5% and 10%, uh, sorry, 5% and 15% compared to just the regular flat planar wing. As we get to the stall regime up around here, 
the non-planar wings perform even better. Um, and this indicates that they are helping to reduce the pressure drag here because in the store regime and beyond, the pressure drag is the dominant component of drag. That's cool because usually non-planar wings are touted as being good for induced drag, but here we see that they are also beneficial for pressure drag under certain circumstances. So at low angle attack, there is little difference in the between the drag coefficients between the two non-planar wings. They're both lying on each other quite tightly, and both within a few percent error, a few percent, which is within the error of the wind tunnel anyway. As we get to high angle attack though, they start to leapfrog each other a lot. Like at one angle attack, one um, wingtip is better, at the other angle attack, another wingtip is better. And so it's kind of difficult to say which one is better overall. At the very high angle attack, then the um, spot, the um, blended wingtip is much better. But in the intermediate region where there is still happening, um, then the spiraled wing is arguably better. So we can conclude here that both non planar wings are also good at reducing the drag compared to the flat wing. So in figure 13, we see the lift to drag ratios, which is a good way of seeing overall which wing is better in terms of aerodynamics. It is clear that below seven degrees, so this line here for the dash lines, uh, the conventional wing is way better. So the conventional like um, wing tip wing is way better than either of the other wings. And then the, the spiraled wing is way better than the flat uh, wing. So I mean, a spiraled wing is like 20% better across these angles of attack for the lift to drag ratio compared to the blended wing as compared to the flat wing. And the blended wing is another 10% better than that. So massive gains are seen here in this region. When we get past seven degrees, then lift to drag ratios of the two non-planar wings start to dance around each other a lot more. And you can't really conclude again, which one is better. Um, it's kind of up in the air. Um, but you can definitely conclude that both are better than the flat planar wing and they maintain like a 10 to 40% higher lift to drag ratio in this stall and post stall regime. So across the board, these two wing tips are better than the flat non wing tip wing. Now, these resources did add some pictures of the CFD post processing data. However, they don't show too much. I mean, for example, in figure 15, we see some streamlines, but I can't really see much of a difference between the flat um, wing and the conventional winglet. But one thing that is funny is that there is still this little vortex at the wingtip of the conventional winglet. So while it definitely does reduce it, as we know from literature, in this particular case, it doesn't eliminate it. So that's pretty interesting to see. In figure 17, they do give the wall shear on the suction side of these wings. Let me zoom in a little bit here. And now the the wall shear is a great way of seeing LSBs because the wall shear is directly related to the velocity of the flow at the wall. For a typical flow going around a wing, this velocity is relatively high, which results in a high wall shear. For an LSB though, the velocity is very much lower because of the flow in this bubble is very slow moving. As a result, the wall shear is very low. So if you plot the wall shear and see a discontinuity in the shear, then that is a good indication of an LSB. Now in these pictures, we don't see any of that. This tells us that the CFD didn't pick up the LSB at all. We can't see this discontinuity um, at all on any of these surfaces. So I think we can conclude that the major reason why the CFD didn't line up well with the experiments is because the LSB formation uh, did occur on the experiments, but didn't occur with the CFD. And I'm like 95% certain that that is the case now. Now, in addition to that, these pressure and wall shear plots are quite useful, except in this particular case, the authors for some reason didn't use the same scale, the color scale. So that makes it a lot harder to compare them. I mean, you can see here that these color bars go from very different values. So that's a tip for when you post-process your CFD data or any data really to make sure you have the same scales and color scales so that it's much easier to compare. Otherwise, we can't really compare them very easily. So that brings us to the end of this podcast. And I should actually mention here that we do have a, um, if you want to get better at CFD, for example, what we've been going through in this podcast, we've been going through a lot of how to analyze CFD, make it better. So not only will it help you with your CFD, but also um, how to read other people's CFD and determine how valuable it is and what you can use of it. Check out our uh, CFD courses in link in the description. We also just released an open foam course, which we've got, been getting some really good reviews back for as well. So we're very confident that you'll find that very interesting and very easy to use in terms of how to learn open foam. Open foam is, if you don't know, it's an open source CFD software, which is really powerful and it's completely free.
So our course teaches you how to use that and it's usually very difficult to learn, but we've broken it down in a way that's very intuitive and you can just follow along the process yourself. You can find that link in the description below. And if you like this podcast, make sure to like it. And if you want to see more like this, click the subscribe button or the follow button, whichever platform you're on. And I'll see you next podcast. Peace, amigos.